Hello everybody, welcome to an episode of In My Opinion. My name is John. My name is Alastair. And my name is Sean. Yes, today we are joined by someone very special. Actually, you may have seen him before, especially if you watch our HDHD series. He's Sean and he's back from Thailand. <laughs> So, welcome, Sean. There, w- there was supposed to be some celebration there, but it's okay. That off cue a bit. Sean, would you like to introduce yourself to uh, our viewers? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sean Fu. I'm the founder of Dear Straight People, which is an LGBT platform that founded in 2015. And it is mm. now Asia's leading LGBT publisher that reaches over 300,000 people a month. Wow. You get the feeling that like I say that a lot, right? <laughs> 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 Wow. 100% not scripted. That one is off the top of his head. <laughs> Definitely not at all. So the reason we have we have Sean on today, okay, Alastair, maybe you want to share with our viewers, right, the reason why we decided to invite Sean on our show today. Yeah, so uh, partially because Sean was the creative head while I was an intern, so I know him personally, but it was also because to, uh, it's actually Pride Month this month and Pink Dot is actually, mm. when this when this releases, Pink Dot is actually this week. So if you guys didn't know, yes. it's probably this week. And we just felt that this was actually a nice topic to think to talk about, especially now, given the whole like, mm. circumstances and like um about gay rights and everything. Uh, cause recently there have also been yes. quite a number of news like let's for example the failed repeal of three seven A and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes. we're we'll talking a little bit about activism and gay rights, especially because we have Sean here who is the founder of the Show People. Yes. So yeah. Correct. He's here to provide the, the critical insight that the two of us cannot provide you. That's right. So you all can thank him in advance. <laughs> That's right. So shall we jump into the questions? Yes, let's begin. Okay, so today we actually have a list of questions for you, Sean. So at any point of time, right, you, are, you please, please share your personal opinion so that our viewers can understand you a little bit better. Okay, so the first question, right, is regarding Dear Straight People, right, which you mentioned, okay? So what would you say is the, gra- is the guiding principle for DSP's content? Because, you know, you mentioned that you're a content publisher, right? I think in terms of the guiding principle, so I think the, okay, the value that DS3 people brings to the community is the fact mm. that DS3 people produces content that, um, about the LGBT community and the issues we face. Uh. And for mm. a community that has been ma- marginalized um, and doesn't re- really receive that much attention, I think that in itself is, is valuable. Uh. So with that in mind, Obviously, the, the, the guiding principle of this Rebels content is to reach as many people as possible. So, to translate to very simple terms, it's just to produce viral content. Mm. Uh, viral mm-hmm. LGBT mm-hmm. content. Uh, mm. But that said, um, not everything that this Rebels produces is engineered for virality. But generally, mm. that is that is what I what I hope to achieve with whatever that this Rebels produces. Mm. And like the underlying message throughout most of the content that you produce is essentially lobbying for gay rights and uh, like, or surrounding like issues that the gay community within Singapore faces, am I right? I wouldn't say lobbying. It's not really lobbying. It's about just shining the spotlight on the LGBT community. Mm-hmm. Um, so it can be, it's not everything is about rights. So sometimes we talk about like open relationships, mm. more controversial topics like that, three-way relationships or like issues like um, HIV, that kind of stuff. So basically, yeah. it's just whatever that is... It's more tailored. La. Yeah, it's more tailored to the LGBT community. So like, if we're going to talk about HIV and stuff, then obviously we're tailored to the LGBT community. Yeah, we wouldn't relate to like straight people and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, seeing that like the content that you produce are like uh, very geared towards the gay community, right? Do you feel like you are... Will you consider yourself an activist? For the gay, like for gay rights and like, like the surrounding LGBT issues, la. Yeah, yeah. No, it, okay. I'm finding a lot because people people always call me an activist. Um, but I've never considered myself an activist. Mm-hmm. Um, because I feel like I haven't earned the right to call myself one. You know, I feel like, okay, I feel like now, right? Everyone wants to be an activist, right? We live in a world where like, everyone wants to be an activist. Mm-hmm. Everyone wants to be a, a peer socially involved and, and yeah. And uh-huh. because of that, like the, the term activist gets thrown around a lot. Like it gets used very loosely. You know? You have yeah. people who like yeah. who like like write write an article on medium about black lives movement and then they call themselves an activist. Like like fuck you la, okay? You are not an activist <laughs> because, because of that, right? Uh, but but okay, sorry, that, that was like a pet peeve. But okay, back back to the question. I feel like generally I don't consider myself an activist because I feel like I haven't earned it. And reason being that um, 
like running deals with people over the years, I've met a lot of people who I would consider real activists. You know, people who really like dedicate themselves to like fighting yeah. and campaigning for social change, um, things like that. And when I compare myself to these people, right, like I haven't I haven't done enough and, and I don't qualify mm. as that. And also cause a big reason is this revolt is commercialized. So I earn money from that la, and I feel like because yeah. of that it just kind of it, it cannot be a platform for activism. No. So so I okay. From a technical standpoint, what Deals Reveal yeah. produces, a lot of it can be considered activism. Like if you look yeah, at yeah. the definition of activism, a lot of, a lot of what Deals Reveal produces is considered activism. But okay. I personally don't identify as one because I don't feel right. like I qualify as one. Mm. Okay. So like having like, known like now might be a waste. <laughs> now might be a good time. To... My... I think my screen is a bit blurry. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it might be a Wi Fi thing. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, so I should just ignore it, uh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, ignore it. For your no. sake, I hope so, uh. <laughs> Yeah, I see that. See that. We only need to produce, you know, social distancing content for y'all. So sometimes it's like that one. Well, please forgive the internet. Singtel, please sponsor us. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for giving us that answer because I think like, you know, a lot of people, uh, especially when they, when they see uh, content creation sites for LGBT uh, community, right? a lot of times I feel like uh, the general public always perceive it as always some kind of activism platform when it's not necessarily always, you know, considered as such by the founder. Uh, mm. Be it like your reason, which is like, you feel that there can be more that can be done by you or be it purely just to be a lifestyle portal. Mm. Let's move on to our next question, shall we? Yes. So you mentioned earlier that uh, about, about commercializing, right? So this question is related to that, okay? So how do you reconcile with the fact that you have to take on corporate sponsorship and brand deals? How do you make sure that your message is not diluted? Okay, um, I've never really had to reconcile because I've never seen it as a problem. Oh, um, okay. I also sometimes don't really understand why people kind of look at sponsored content as like this ego thing. And I, I think mm. part of the reason is because like I, I actually work in this industry, you know? Like the the, the is like my, my side thing, but like my day job yeah. is in the online media industry. So I understand yeah. how the whole ecosystem works. And I understand that um that sponsored content is necessary uh, for any platform to be sustainable. Um yeah. I mean there are other models that a media platform can use. You can like depend on Patreon or you can use like a membership subscription thing. But there is like, number one, it's very difficult to kind of build on that platform as compared to just getting mm. sponsorships. And number two, there's like a glass ceiling when it comes to that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, model because then you're very answerable mm. to whoever who's subscribing and supporting you. Um, yeah, and yeah. I, I still kind of want the liberty with how I produce my content and what I choose to produce. Mm. Um, yeah, so mm. I also personally feel like... Um, Sponsored content, I mean, okay, sponsorships and the inherent value of content are not two mutually exclusive things, you know? Mm. Um, there is a way that you can align that, right? And honestly, for any marketing campaign to be successful, it has to align, right? Mm. And I feel like mm. as content creators, um, since, I mean, all three of us are content creators, right? As content creators, it's really our responsibility to try to ensure that when we do take on sponsorships, the content that we produce is not too diluted and it's our responsibility to advise the clients out of the business on, on the best mm, way to mm, do mm. so in a way that aligns with our platform and our branding. So so you know to that effect to that effect, I guess like this question about dilution, right? Would it be safe to say that if let's say you do encounter uh, an offer that that may, you know, cause you to look too much like a sell out, it's not within the realms of impossibility that you will reject lah. Yes, I, I do re- I mean I do reject if if like the, the business is a bit dodgy like like yeah um, or if I just get very off vibes. But at the same time I think most of the time because I don't go out looking for sponsorships when it comes to DS3 people, right? Mm. All the clients that I have, they is they all approach me one. And I think mm. for them to approach me means obviously whatever that they're pushing or selling, it aligns with the LGBT community. And that's why they're right, right, in right. So with that in mind, naturally whatever that they come it, it always aligns up. A lot of them are LGBT mm. businesses themselves. Mm. I feel like most people's like knee-jerk reaction when it comes to like sponsorships like for uh, content, video content producers especially on the social media side is that like that these people are being a sellout or like they are like 
basically throwing away their original not message. Honest, like not honest, right? Ah, yeah, correct. That's like the immediate knee-jerk reaction. And like, I, Sammy don't understand this. Like, it's just, I mean, you can you can keep your artistic integrity or like your message integrity st- still while still trying to earn some money. And in fact, the, the reason why they are able to produce content is because they are able to earn money. La, and a because lot of they times, are well fed. Yeah. And a lot of times, if you don't have that money, you just won't have that content out for you. And then, then it's like, what's the point, right? Like, you might, you have to choose one or the other. Especially if, because a lot yeah. of things like don't just happen because of passion or like, like just purely based on passion. Some, some, the world's a bit more <laughs> cruel than that. So unfortunately, money has to be involved at certain points. Uh, but I don't think it's a big, huge red flag as well. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, but I do agree with Sean also. You know, he mentioned about how it's the responsibility of the creator to ensure that your brand is not diluted mm. when you pick up sponsorship deals. So, you know, that's a fine line. Uh. Yeah. Yeah, so like actually... That's probably one of the criticisms that DSP has, right? That like you guys actually have corporate sponsorships. So are there any other like criticisms of DSP and its content that you have received like over the years? Because you've started since like 2015, so that's like been five years really. Yeah. So Confo go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Where do I begin? Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> oh, nice. People have, people, have, people, people have said all kinds of shit about Year Street People over the years la, and I think that is that is a very natural thing. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, as, as any platform gets bigger, you're bound to attract criticism, partly because expectations become higher mm. and also partly because you kind of lose that whole underdog, underrated factor, right? And people are going to become more critical. Yeah. Um, so mm. in terms of criticism, commercialization is one of the biggest, most common criticisms. So the other is like, um, so one, one is like, okay, one, criticism that I always hear is like dear straight people always only promotes good looking people <laughs> which I have always felt is unfair because okay okay so d- just okay so dear straight people is, is best known for its coming out stories okay yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and generally it takes me an average of about two weeks to do one coming out story right interview okay. transcription um so normally there's pre-interview, then the actual interview, and then everything else. So the entire process takes about two weeks. So every interviewee that I do, right, like I don't just interview anyone, you know, I always own the mm. person needs to have an angle. And nobody has ever been interviewed because just purely because they're good looking. Like that is not an angle, you know. Um mm. and obviously after a while, I mean that there, there are a lot of factors that go into why certain coming out stories do better than others. And some of it is the subjects, they, they have a strong angle and also they happen to be conventionally attractive. Mm, and then yeah. their story naturally gets read, read, read uh, more compared to someone who's maybe not as conventionally attractive. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I feel like, so that's where the criticism comes from. Because like, like the most read story, sometimes it belongs to good-looking people. And then people form yeah. the impression just based purely on whatever that pops up on their newsfeed and they say, this will only the most good-looking people. Um, yeah, which is unfair of course like I can't control that one right I can't yeah. <laughs> like if it's a, you know just that's just the way the world works huh? and that is true yeah, yeah and sometimes also certain like I think sometimes people think that like um, I, I feature certain people because they're insta famous or whatever um, and honestly I, ne- I don't do that I think I did that once or twice before like when I was first starting out and then I realised that in Instagram of popularity does not translate to to views. Like it really, there is zero correlation. Like it doesn't help at all. <laughs> um. So mm-hmm. so I I don't I don't do that at all. I mean, like I did that maybe for once once or twice, like very very long, four or five years ago, just to test it out. But but after interviewing so many people and kind of seeing seeing the the, the stats and everything and seeing the reception to each and every story, um. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's really the person needs to have an angle and a strong story behind them. And yeah, so so I think that that is a very common criticism. Like uh, people get the impression that oh, yeah. this show only promotes like good looking people, but no like, But that is not the case. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely in fact, I think not you know if case. people if people if people just focus on the 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 appearance thing, they very much miss the point of the story behind that piece of content. Especially if you mention them to be coming out stories, lah. In a weird way, like them pointing out that they are attractive is technically being discriminatory because of the looks as well. Because, I mean, if they look at the story itself, 
is able is probably a story that we able to hold on its own because like I mean mm. all these people are able to have like they have great stories and they have like a lot of like uh, inspirational messages to send. So the fact that you just go like oh you only you only feature him because he's he or she is uh attractive, then that's kind of like missing the point and you're kind of like it the, is, re- eh? the reason why there's this problem. But, uh, but I guess this is the this is the case for for a lot of media publishing subject matter, you know? Mm-hmm. Like you know, what? it's just just you know, just a bit strange that, you know, DSP got big enough that now this has become a, a issue, a potential <laughs> issue. <laughs> but I mean Which is so unfortunate. Yeah, but I mean like even for HTHT let's let's say we take HTHT as an example. Like most of the people on HTHT, in fact actually all of them are pretty good looking people. <laughs> it's not that cause I chose hey, thanks. Hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's just thanks also, thanks also. Oh, I hope lah. <laughs> but like, it's it's actually it's and not I because came back twice I chose. Thank you. Oh, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's not because I went to Instagram and scrolled down my feet and go like, oh, John is good looking, or like, oh, Gwen is good looking. It's just because I feel like they were interesting people and I want to interview them. So, I mean, maybe you guys are not. You guys should be like looking. It's a two-way street, right? Like the content producer has to uh look past the the, um, the superficial things. And that we mm. is like our responsibility as well. But from the side of the content consumer, you also have to look past the superficial stuff. Uh. So you can't just be focusing on the person's looks, like really go and listen to what the person has to say. Yeah. Uh. I think if we yeah. both do that, then we're able to come to a better like world and yeah. have a better message. It's not it's not con- you know the criticism like that, they're not constructive. You know what I mean, right? Mm. As a content creator, I very much rather you tell me that oh this piece of content sucks, I, and then I think it's it's better if you do this, do this, do this. Then you tell me like my talent, too good looking or my talent ugly. It is does not value add to the experience that I'm trying to provide. Mm. Unless of course I'm I'm a I don't know magazine for for semi naked people like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more? Then that will be the entire the entire selling point, right? <laughs> But are there any more criticisms of DSP other than this, like, this thing? Uh, wow. Well, I can go on and on. And another comment. Okay, what's the one that bothers you most? The what the you know how about you give us the top three uh, that irks you the most? Okay, I wouldn't say irk because I understand where all the people, uh. like okay number the most common one is commercialization. Mm. I I understand okay. completely where that criticism comes from. Um, I think that is especially okay. So I think what you all need to understand is that. Um, a lot of people they chance across a uh, digital real content like maybe they chance across like a coming out story or they chance across mm. like a video on like a same sex couple or like an opinion piece so basically very socially conscious content mm. right and then yeah. they, they, yeah, yeah, they yeah. become a fan of the work and they follow their real on Facebook YouTube or, or mm. Instagram or whatever yeah. and then after that mm. suddenly they see like a, a piece of lifestyle content maybe like they suddenly see their real is promoting a party or their real is promoting underwear and then it suddenly mm. clashes with their their, their, their expectation of what their studio should be. Mm, yeah. Right? Um, but then, from my opinion, like, as a content creator, like, I mean, okay, like, if you don't like this kind of content, but there are people out there who like to party or actually, like, like, you know, lifestyle content also has value in itself, like, right? Mm, yeah. Um, yes. So, yes. so, just because it doesn't suit your, your taste doesn't make it inherently bad, like, you know? Mm. Um, their studio case okay, is as an LGBT person, I'm trying to cater to the entire community. So I try to produce not just like socially conscious stuff, but also lifestyle content. Yeah. So I think, mm. so I understand where the region is coming from. The other one that I think that was quite big um, is also that I think Dear Straight Road is not, it's not um, racially inclusive enough. Okay. Um, so one of the oh, early wow. criticisms that came out Mm. So this was one of the very early criticisms that came out. I remember, yeah. uh, well, this was like, well, this was years ago. I, I published an article, um, 25 pioneers of, 20, 20 pioneers of the LGBT community mm. um, in, Singapore in Singapore that millennials don't know okay. about. All right. Yeah. So 20, 20, 20 pioneers of the LGBT community that millennials don't know about. And Mm-mm. in the initial list that I published, they, they were all Chinese. Okay. So that there were no Malay or Indian mm. um pioneers featured. Other uh, races. And la. that one got yeah, there were no other races and that one got huge backlash. 
but I think that criticism was fair because you know as, as a Chinese Singaporean you, you enjoy that Chinese privilege uh, so you don't think about these kind of things right yeah, so yeah. that was me when I was very raw and I was like, I just coming out and I didn't and I, I, I would I, that never even occurred to me that that, that list was not racially inclusive so mm. I, I updated mm. that list with like um, with by adding like um, more minority pioneers inside and then since then as much as possible I'll try to always have like um, like in whatever project that I do, I make sure that it's that it's as racially diverse as possible. Mm. Um, mm. But sometimes I still get that criticism because what people don't understand is like certain demographics are a lot harder to feature as compared to other demographics. Yeah. Like the easiest demographic generally that you can get to appear on a very public LGBT platform like Dear Trigger would be like Chinese gay Singaporeans. Mm. Mm. Right. At, where, where, where it's like trying to get a Malay to appear right, is very difficult. Mm. There are only a few of them out there that were there to appear. Trying to get um, Indians also um, is definitely harder in communicating the Chinese. So so yeah. whenever I do like a big project like so now this people is currently running like um, this this community driven project called Letters to My Closet. Um, yes. So I also make sure that I have like every race covered as much as possible. Mm. Um. So it's like so. Cause so how that project worked was that you now I put out an open call and then people signed up. But certain like there were some certain demographics that did not sign up at all, and I had to personally go and find, you know, to make sure that they are represented. But mm. sometimes people were the criticism will still come now like a hey, like why only like one Malay, or why only like mm. one Indian that kind of thing. Mm. <laughs> so, but it's not necessarily so uh, it's, purposely you do that one. Correct. It's really like there is no one. You know. Mm. Like there's no one or they don't want to appear. You know, things yeah. like that. Actually, I feel like this is a nice segue to the next question actually because uh, we're about to ask you one of the same love documentary episodes which is actually featuring uh, a Malay gay, gay Malay couple which I actually helped to shoot as well. So, it actually <laughs> went viral and like, uh, it actually gained quite a good amount of media attention even overseas. Like, uh, basically, there was a lot of like backlash, a lot of controversy surrounding the whole video. We will link. We will link in the description box. Yes, we will. And go and watch. Yeah, and I just the question that we want to ask you is that like, um, do you feel like despite the backlash, despite all the problems that came with it, despite all the controversy that came with it, do you still think it's a good step forward for like gay rights and everything, or like is there any concerns that come with having such a controversial piece? I think concerns wise, definitely there was. Okay, personally, it didn't affect me. Like all the homophobic comments on um, that, mm. that, that that video received, it didn't affect me because I've gotten a lot of it over the years and I'm very numb to it and I'm very used to it. So it doesn't bother me one bit. But I was concerned. Mm. Okay, so the thing about this video was that it didn't go viral in Singapore. It went viral in Malaysia. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, so so a lot of the, so most of the people watching were Malaysians. Uh, um, and what I was very concerned was that, like, imagine, like, you have, like, a closeted Malay person who's really struggling with their sexuality, and then they come across this video, and then, actually, the video is a very positive portrayal of a gay Malay couple, but then they see mm. the amount of hate in the comments, and my yeah. concern was that they will be traumatized by that, like, and I think it's very traumatizing for anyone who's watching it and seeing the amount of hate from your own community coming in. Yeah. But I yeah. think in the, grand scheme of th- in the grand scheme of things, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, because like this video, it didn't just go viral like online. It went viral from what I heard. It went viral offline as well. Like it was being circulated in WhatsApp group chats and like taxi oh, drivers wow. were talking about it. It was like that that kind of viral. And pra- practically, practically every single Malay media publication picked up on that video. Um, mm. Some of them gave a positive slant to it. Some of them did not give a positive slant to it, depending on the, the publication. Uh, but like practically every yeah. media publication picked up it. And I think that was a step in the right direction because this video was really like showing a lot of people who don't normally consume like positive LGBT content um, that it is possible for a same-sex Malay couple to be happy, to be together and to yeah. be accepted and to be open, you know? And I guess that's also partly why it got so much backlash uh, because it contradicts with the worldview and, and, and stuff. But I think in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to social change, people will always feel uncomfortable at first before mm. any progress mm. Must open the can of worms to pour out the worms. <laughs> yeah, and I think in time to come, this video will be a very important resource for especially the Malay community. Like, like if they 
it's like you have like uh, they sound like a Malay youth or whatever they're struggling and then they go on the internet and search like gay Malay couple they'll probably come across that video and they'll see that ah. you know, like a very powerful power, powerful visual representation that yes you can be gay you can be Malay but you can still have a happy life your family can still eventually accept you um, mm. and you can live openly with your partner or whatever I think that's very mm. very important but I do think that the concern that like the because these people like the gay couple who came out on, on like the video, actually, I mean, they already came out already, but like the people who actually like put like their, their, their oh, relationship yeah. on in public, right? Actually, yeah. like when they do it like to other people, they will be looking at the response also. So like uh, people who are gay, who are Malay, who are in the closet and everything, they'll look at the like the very, rather the bad reception and be a little, I understandably a little bit scared. Huh? So like, is there anything that you want to say to the, this like demographic of people if they are scared seeing the backlash that came with it? Uh, I think that don't, don't mind the backlash so much because at the end of the day, I think what everyone wants is like a stable, happy life. With, with, I mean, okay, what a lot of people want is a stable, happy life with their partner. So try to not focus so much on the homophobic comments on that video and rather focus on the message that the video is trying to convey which is that mm-hmm. you, know, you can be Mal- you can be gay you can be malay but you can still be happy and and accepted and in a, in a stable long term relationship mm. i think that's a that's a a pretty important uh, perspective shift to have lah cuz i think it's very easy to be to be to have this 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 main story overshadowed by people's reactions yeah and you know that shouldn't be the case lah yeah mm. And okay, so why don't we go on to the next question? And this question I actually very personally like. So mm. I actually went to Google a bit of statistics and it found out that so in 2019 they did a survey and they found out that 56% of Singaporeans actually say that they are against same sex marriage. So mm. as much as we feel like the world is becoming more accepting, and I mean I'm and I mean I'm sure it is, um, there's still 56%, which is like basically the large majority of people who are pretty much not yeah. very accepting still at this point. So like for uh, for someone who actually does like a lot of activism related messages and like trying to lobby for a bit for gay rights, right? How wary are you that your activism is just becoming like an echo chamber and not reaching the right audience, which is which is who I feel are the ones that are against same-sex marriage? Okay, I think that is a very good question. And I will also say that is the biggest concern that the Australian world has, you know? Hmm. Um, I think the problem is that for dear straight people, right, the kind of activism or the kind of value that dear straight, dear straight people brings to community is that its goal is to kind of reach and engage as many people as possible online. But yeah. the problem yes. with that is that so, social social media facilitates echo chambers, right? Hmm. You know, hmm. you, we live in a world where you can just like you can just block or unfollow or mute whoever who you don't agree with. You know, you only like yes. or follow pages that align. That fundamentally align with your own interests and beliefs. So, so yeah. everyone lives in an echo chamber. Like everyone today, all we all live in an echo chamber, and mm. be- because of that, it makes it very hard for the people's content to kind of break out of the people's own echo chamber. Um, yeah. But I think with that said, it, it's hard, but it's not impossible. Um, I think Falik and Kao's video was one example of a piece of content that really broke through the echo chamber and reached a whole new segment of people that don't usually. Con- consume LGBT content and, and that's also where the incredible backlash came from because uh, like these people would have thought it impossible for a same-sex Malay couple to be happy and to be stable you know? mm. and I think over the years this video has produced a, a few pieces of content that have managed to achieve the effect so apart from the party and Carl, um, another one is um, I did this feature on Jilin and Jolin which is a lesbian couple in Singapore like they got married with you know, hotel ceremony with uh, like the entire family there with the young sing everything oh. um, and that and that and that piece of content actually went viral in like Taiwan and China, like there are translated versions of that of the article on like Weibo and, and and things like that. So so mm. that article managed to also break through like you know this Weibo's main English, um Asia echo chamber and kind of reach a whole new audience. And another one was like um, I took this photo of um Li Huang Wu, who is the gay grandson of Li Kuan Yu, yeah. with um his husband. E-Ray, I think two or two or three years ago at Pink Dot, and that mm-hmm. photo single-handedly went super viral. Like it was being circulated in all the anti-WhatsApp chats. So, 
<laughs> so, 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 yeah lah. I think, in general, I think all content creators, I think when it comes to like impacting people, echo chambers are an issue, it's, but it's, it's hard, but it's not impossible. Like, it can be done. Yeah. Mm. Even for like a small channel like mine, like IMO, sometimes we do uh, share some like social, social justice like messages and like we talk a little bit about social issues going on in Singapore. And it does like bother me a little bit that like, okay, I see very nice comments and I see very nice people like, like saying very nice things in the comment section below and like people supporting me and like everything, what's blah, blah, blah. But like at the same time, I'm just wondering like, are these people, did I change their minds or like they already believed in this? Then they're already the here, right? They already know already. Yeah. Like they already know maybe, these things. Then I the tell them again for what? Maybe the secret, right, is to find a way to invade the auntie uncle WhatsApp groups. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> the secret. <laughs> you make that by making viral content, right? Like you actually have to, like, I think John, uh, John and I actually talked a little bit about this before. Uh, you have to market your activism like it's a product. Like it's like, yes. you have to actually treat it like a pitch, like a market pitch. It's not like something yes. that you just put it out there and like, you're like, yeah, you better listen to me. But it's not like people won't listen to you just because <laughs> just because your message yes. is good. I mean, yes. there are a lot of nice, good messages out there, but it doesn't mean people will yeah. just like listen to you. Right? So you still have to market yeah. it out properly and package it in it a nice way. It has to be approachable yeah. for people who are ignorant. Yeah, and I think this is a very important thing to make sure that your Activism is not just like basically circulating within a group of people who already believe in you already. It's supposed to be trying yeah, to... Then it's like you all just people. link arms in one circle in Zook and like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then it, it gets nowhere. When actually what you need to do is to change minds. Change minds. I think that's the most... Imp- like, I think yeah. as an activist, you have, to, you have to understand that like, yeah, people won't approach you or like people won't really um, go out of their way to find out these things unless they are like... Mo- and like hardly anyone is motivated to do so. Mm. So you do have to like step out of your own comfort zone to get them in. And it's not the yeah. most of the time it's not the other way around. It's not not really that they have to I mean they have to do it as well, but I feel like the first step should be It's a two way uh, street also. Yeah, the, but the first step I feel like should be on the responsibility of the activists lah, and the people who are spreading the message. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So I think Let's go on to the last question that we have for today. And I think it's a nice little throwback question and a nice little wrap-up question yeah. as well. So, it's you guys... some time, uh, so my memory not as good, but Alastair will probably remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, uh, Sean actually has a HDHD episode. We will link it down in the, bu- in, like, in the description box below as well, so you can go and watch it. It's 55 minutes of him, if you guys are very interested about him. But basically, uh, in the episode, Sean said, uh, well, to the response to one question, Sean actually said that he wishes that gay community was a bit more organized in his efforts. And I feel, do you feel like this has improved in the last year? And how do you feel like people at home or in the gay community can actually help to uh, lobby for the gay rights and like help to contribute to this cause? It doesn't need to be very specific things. It can be like a more general, uh, broad idea. But like generally, how can people at home, who are anyone who's watching this, help? Okay, I think wait, that, that's actually a few questions. I think there's two questions, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there's two questions. Yeah. Okay, in terms of whether like more united... I mean, from my personal perspective, I don't think things have changed that much. Lah. But okay. I think what... Um, okay, you, what, what you all need to understand also is that, um, number one, um, I personally am not very involved in the whole active activism com- like that whole activist community right mm. Mm. so this real functions quite personally and my social circle my primary social circle they are not activists like you know whereas i think like a lot of the really like activists activist people their entire social circle is just like, other activists so for me i don't really hang out with, with them like, um, mm. on a like um, on a f- you know uh, regularly yeah. Yeah. so i also yeah. not very sure what they are doing that, but just from my perspective, as kind of like an, an outsider of sorts, it doesn't seem like a very organized effort. But with that said, I think one big reason is because like the all the different LGBT organizations in, in Singapore or they all have very, very different goals, you know. Mm. So like here's a report, it's really about producing content that reaches as many people as possible. Um, um then you have like 
Google Chaga who like does counseling for the LGBT community or T Project who like uh, who provides support and a shelter for trans people. So everyone's primary goal is very different. Mm. But our overarching goal is the same now, which is we all want equality and acceptance and inclusiveness. But but our primary goals are very different. So so which is also why everyone is kind of like doing their own thing, you know? Mm. Mm. Uh mm. yeah, so that's the first that's the first question. Then the, the second question I would say, um I guess if you're a, you're a straight person and you you're trying to understand more about this topic, um if you have LGBT plus friends or whatever, or even if you're LGBT plus person yourself, um try to listen more, try to empathize more. And if you don't understand something, mm. um, you know, just try to read up more about it, like educate like, educate yourself about it. Or you can always discuss with people who you think would, would know more about the matter. Like. Mm. And you can also try to support like LGBT businesses or the LGBT organizations around because a lot of them, especially now, they, they will they will require funds um to continue running their operations. Um I think just really did an article on this are like uh, LGBT organizations that you can that you can donate to. Um, mm. Yeah, and if you if you want to and if you think that this repo's work is important, then you can like and <laughs> like and share our content. Yeah, <laughs> <Shameless> <laughs> and, yeah send and send to WhatsApp really, groups. Really, Don't just like and share. Send to the WhatsApp groups. The anti yeah, WhatsApp groups. Or send everything that you receive to all the anti WhatsApp groups. Like everything <laughs> that we <laughs> uh, uh, Yeah, so I think just something as simple as just um mm. Um, yeah, liking, sharing content, supporting your LGBT organizations, talking to your friends, and educating yourself. Because like, I think even within the LGBT community, like, it's a very, it's a very diverse community, you know? Mm. Like, I know, mm. like, straight people tend to kind of lump all of us together, but, like, the gay community is very, very different from, like, the trans community. It's very, very different from the lesbian community. Mm. Like, mm. you know, and the, even the culture within each community is very, very different. So, mm. so, so even as a gay person, I wouldn't say like I understand a lot about the other, um, the other communities. Uh, so try to always educate and engage as much as possible. Mm. I think this is something that like IMO. Every time we talk about social issues, we also end the topic with the almost the same message, which is basically be empathetic. Yeah. With like and actually keep an open mind when you're listening to people's issues, because. Yes. There are a lot of injustices in the world. There's a lot of wrong with the world. But yeah. uh, at the same time, if we all just remain a little bit more open-minded and we all like just enter conversations with a bit more empathetic mind and empathet- and like basically with the willingness to listen, right? The world Correct. will be like a lot better. And I think... Yeah. Don't shun and shy away from people that, you know, or things or topics that you don't necessarily understand or relate to. Hmm. You know, especially if like uh these 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 people and these topics deserve to be heard. Yeah. And I think that's like Alastair mentioned, uh, this is the main message that we usually have when we try to spread some positive vibes, you know? Mm. <laughs> and yeah. So with that, this is a nice way to end it, right? Nice little warm message and nice cuddly message to end it on. <laughs> it so- is. Actually, you know, I I, 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 mean, since this is this is Pride Month, and then we have Sean here, and then you know, this is a topic that is worth discussing. If you all have any, you know, additional questions and stuff like that, you want us to direct towards Sean, or if you want to ask us because we look like we know things, uh, we may not know as much, but we will try our best. Leave it in the comments <laughs> below, man. And then you, I mean, you can always always ask your questions, and we'll try our best to give you an answer. And if we cannot, we will refer you to someone who can. That's right. Steady one. And. Stay yeah, safe. stay safe. Phase two coming. We filming this on Thursday, so phase two is tomorrow. Phase two will be here by yeah. By the time this video is already you phase see, two, right? Uh, everybody rush into the high tilau already. <laughs> stay safe, guys. Let's 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 keep this going and yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching, guys. Yes, thank you so much for coming today. Thank, thank you. you, Sean, for coming back again. Thank you guys. <laughs> thank you for having me back again. <laughs> yes. Bye. Bye.